Good afternoon in Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, good morning in the USA. Good evening if you're in Asia and welcome to this event from the Asia Scotland Institute. Uh, my name is Martin Perbrick. I'll moderate the discussion today. Uh, with us is Roddy Gao, chairman and founder of the Asia Scotland Institute, who's, who's sitting uh, in the new town of Edinburgh. Uh, and our focus today is a discussion of US foreign policy in Asia. Our guests are two exceptional academics and commentators, who I think are probably very well known to, to all of you. Um, first, uh, we have Rana Mitta, Professor of History and Politics uh, of Modern China and a Fellow of St. Cross College at the University of Oxford. Um, he's the author of multiple books, but the most, uh, the most highly sold, I, I, I suspect, are China's War with Japan, The Struggle for Survival, 1937 to 1945, and his latest book, China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism. I, I've read both. I'm glad to tell you I bought both, Rana, as well. Uh, and, and I'd recommend them to everyone, especially the, uh, the latest book, as, as many people, I think, would, so would suggest that the Chinese Communist Party it's not a communist party, obviously it's, it's a nationalist party and I think you'll um, understand that more from reading Rana's book. Um, Rana's also co-author with Sophia Gaston of the report uh, conceptualizing a UK-China engagement strategy which was via the British Foreign Policy Group in 2020. Uh, he, in 2020 he also won the Medlicott Medal for Service to History awarded by the Historical Association. He's a fellow of the British Academy and an officer of the Order of the British Empire, OBE. Um, thank you very much, Rana. Um, calling in from the east coast of the US is Michael Oslin. He's a Payson J. Treat Distinguished Refer Research Fellow in Contemporary Asia at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University. Michael is a historian by training. He specializes in US policy in Asia and geopolitical issues in the Indo-Pacific region. Previously, Michael was an Associate Professor of History at Yale University and Visiting Professor at the University of Tokyo. He's a senior Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, Senior Advisor for Asia at the Halifax International Security Forum, and a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Michael has also authored multiple books, I'll just mention several, uh, Asia's New Geopolitics, Essays on Reshaping the Indo-Pacific, um, best-selling End of the Asian Century, War Stagnation and Risks to the World's Most Dynamic Region. I think the titles sum up the content very, very nicely. Uh, Michael is a long-term contributor to the Wall Street Journal. His writing appears in, in many other leading publications and, and hence I'm sure you've heard of him. So as we don't want to take too much time, I'd like to kick off the discussion. We'll, we'll ask both of our guests to um, say something on their own views of US foreign policy in Asia, and then we'll have discussion after that. Um, so uh, Michael, would you mind to um, kick us off and take us through your views on the current state of US policy in Asia? Well, good morning uh, from Washington. Thank you, Martin and, and Roddy. It's always a pleasure to be back with my old friend Rana and to, to speak to, uh, to friends and uh, colleagues who are thinking about Asia uh, broadly uh, around the world, not just from a, from a U.S. perspective. So what, what I'd like to do, and just take a few minutes, because I know that primarily we want to have a discussion and we want to get to your questions, is talk a little bit about the Biden administration and, and what it's doing uh, in Asia and, and how it looks from uh, not just the DC perspective, but from the American perspective, uh, and then hopefully get to a, a broad conversation about that. Um, I think it's fair to say that if there's one uh, uh, one peg on which the Biden administration is hanging its its foreign policy, it is on Asia and more specifically uh, on China. This is this is the, I think, one area where there is not only continuity with uh, the Trump administration, but very much the uh, the Biden administration has in its first 100 plus days now made clear uh, that this will be the, the sort of defining, <clears throat> pardon me, defining if not structuring approach to uh, to the world that that they are taking. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the debate and discussion about the Biden administration was on how different it would be from from Trump uh, and from the Trump team, uh, how much they would turn back to international institutions or turn back to allies, uh, bring the United States as as they would put it back into the international community. Uh, but on Asia, there's a, a striking continuity. In fact, in in some ways. Uh, they've gone beyond uh, the Trump administration uh, in Asia in, in ways that are are good and in ways that uh, I think raise uh, potentially raise some questions about the long term viability of, of their approach. Um, so what uh, what has not changed? 
Well, what hasn't changed is the general sense that the United States uh, is in a, a generational competition, a strategic competition, and some uh, might well term it an adversarial competition with, with China, uh, and that for the future of the United States, Asia is the most important, uh, most vital region of the world for economic purposes, because of security concerns, uh, because of the competition between two different, uh, I mean, to put it in, in the sort of Manichaean sense that it often is uh, is expressed two different uh, uh, ways of approaching government and society, one being open and consensual and pluralistic, the other being uh, hierarchical and, and uh, authoritarian, if not totalitarian and top down. Um, th this has been the, the expression uh, that the Biden administration has provided both to the American people and to the world about why it is maintaining uh, its pressure on, uh, on China and why it is seeking to reach out to, uh, to Asian partners and to define, in essence, a new era of competition between the United States uh, and China. So at least in these first three months, and I think we need to recognize that it is, is, it is still early days, uh, the administration needs to complete its own reviews. It's doing one in the Pentagon, it's doing others. It needs to do its capstone documents, such as a national security strategy and then the national defense strategy. Um, but at least in these first three months or so, it has maintained essentially all of the different policies that the Trump administration uh, adopted and imposed over the past four years. So the tariffs on Chinese goods are still there. Uh, the ban on Huawei and ZTE and, and other Chinese telecommunications uh, companies from America's 5G networks and, and more broadly from uh, our telecommunication systems uh, are there. Uh, the freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea uh, have continued. Uh, the, the focus on alliances uh, have continued. Uh, the uh, continue, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, picking up from the Trump administration's uh, uh, reviving of the Quad uh, security dialogue has, has continued. Um, certainly the rhetorical uh, battle, if I can put it that way, between the United States and China has continued. So in the first three months, we did not see a precipitous uh, U-turn or, or, or retrenchment or withdrawal or softening of the U.S. position towards China. Uh, and indeed, the administration made the same uh, types of statements about the importance of allies, about deepening, uh, deepening relationships uh, as, as the Trump administration had. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, in some ways, in fact, the Biden administration has gone farther than the Trump administration. Uh, I, let me start with the Quad. Um, this is, I think, an, an excellent development and one that is uh, both to be encouraged, but also watched to see what actually happens with it. Um, <clears throat> the Trump administration, after about a decade of, of uh, abeyance of, of any type of Quad activities, restarted it in 2017, and, and they had fairly regular foreign minister level meetings. Uh, within the first month of the administration, the Biden administration, they had a foreign, uh, foreign minister level meeting, but then the president uh, hosted a, uh, a, a, a principals meeting, meaning a meeting of the, the heads of state himself, and then the prime ministers of Japan, Australia, and India, uh, taking it to a level it had, it had not achieved before. And I think that's, that's very important. And clearly the rhetoric surrounding it uh, was that this would be a priority for the administration. We have to see what that actually means, what, what actual activities come out of it. Um, but the, uh, the naval exercises have been revitalized. Uh, Japan has become fully a part of those naval exercises uh, with India and Australia, the Malabar exercises. And of course, just getting the four heads of state together, I think, I think was central. Um, on Taiwan, the administration, I think surprisingly, has actually gone farther than the Trump administration. Uh, they, they sent uh, the first US ambassador to visit uh, in, uh, in something like 40 years since normalization with China. Um, they, their rhetoric has been, if anything, even stronger than the Trump administration. They invited uh, the Taiwanese representative in the United States to the inauguration, uh, and they have made it clear, uh, even in, in statements as recently as this week, about their concern over uh, Chinese pressure on Taiwan, about the fear uh, of war with Taiwan. Of course, just two weeks ago, the president met with Japanese Prime Minister Suga, his first meeting at the White House. 
uh, again, prioritizing the US-Japan alliance uh, and the relationship and talking about, uh, about all of the different ways in which they will be seeking to uphold the, uh, the, the international order and, and international norms and rules in Asia. And in fact, just today in Washington, uh, Britain's first sea lord is meeting with the chief of naval operations here to discuss how they will be cooperating more in the Indo-Pacific region. And of course, that is tied to the uh, deployment of Queen, the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier and an aircraft carrier strike group out to the region. Uh, and it has been intimated, at least, that they will do actual formal freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. So from all of these perspectives, uh, the, the, Trump, uh, the Biden administration has maintained the policies of the Trump administration. And so just to wrap up then, uh, let me look a little bit going forward and, uh, and talk about things to, to watch. First of all, the big meta question is, do they maintain this pressure? Uh, in some ways, uh, it is going to be difficult for them to, uh, to retrench or take another, uh, another route, one that would be potentially softer, or some might even say more accommodating, precisely because of the way in which they've come out so strongly uh, from the gate and, and have made this e essentially the linchpin of their, of their foreign policy. Um, but there are a lot of hard questions ahead. How long do you maintain the tariffs, uh, especially if it looks like China uh, is not living up to its agreements under phase one? Do you deepen them? Do you try to soften them to get more cooperation? What do you do on, on the economic front? Um, is there going to be a reassessment of bringing Huawei and other companies into America's telecommunications uh, networks, uh, again, potentially to try to get more cooperation? Um, the administration, I should mention, has also uh, maintained the Trump uh, designation of uh, what's happening in Xinjiang against the Uyghurs as a genocide. Uh, is that something where they now begin uh, maintaining sanctions and uh, putting sanctions on Chinese officials? Or again, do they, do they uh, change tack uh, over time? Uh, so the, the big question is over, over the next three plus years now, almost four years, what will they be doing uh, in terms of not only keeping pressure on, on China to try and, and uh, generate behavior that they think is, is more uh, conducive to peaceful relations. But what do they actually build? What is it that they are ultimately trying to accomplish? That's what they have to articulate. Is it a, a continuation of a policy of reciprocity? Is it to create a level playing field? Is it to create a new network uh, of, uh, of, of democracy uh, nations that are allied and they've talked about this? Uh, against China? Is it really about China? What they have to do ultimately is articulate what they are trying to do beyond, of course, upholding the rules-based international order uh, in, in East Asia. Um, where I think uh, they will find the, the most uh, problem going forward uh, is with Chinese response uh, and, and pressures. Um, Beijing will try to do a few different things. I'm going to let Rana talk, talk more about that, but um, they already are putting pressure on allies such as Australia, and we saw the, um, the cancellation of the strategic uh, economic dialogue between the two countries today, um, ultimately to try to get countries, both uh, those that are formal allies of the United States and others that are not, to adjust their positions in ways that, uh, that essentially wind up supporting Chinese, uh, Chinese desired outcomes in, in the region, whether it's over um, things like the Whitsun Reef and, and the Philippines and the South China Sea, whether it's over Australia's attempts to, uh, to block further Chinese uh, interference in, in Australian politics or, or to call for um, uh, investigations of the outbreak of the, the coronavirus, all of these different um, attempts to basically cut the United States off from allies to alienate and, and uh, pressure uh, different nations into at least stepping back from what seemed to be hardening positions towards uh, towards uh, China. This is what the administration will ultimately have, have to face and have to deal with and to find whether it's going to have partners and allies or whether it's going to be largely isolated in its attempts to deal with China. And if it is going to be isolated, then how comfortable it is maintaining this type of pressure. Is it in short, willing to accept an adversarial relationship with China over the next four years. 
Um, let me stop there because I know we want to get to Rana and then to questions. I'll just say we should also probably talk about North Korea uh, down the line, talk about things like the comprehensive and progressive trans-Pacific uh, partnership on free trade and economics. There's a lot of other things that the administration has to be dealing with, uh, but all of the, the region's eyes, the world's eyes, will be primarily on the China policies that I've laid out. So thank you. Michael, thank you very much. Um, before we hand over to Rana, can I just ask you sort of a subsidiary question, I think, to clarify some of what you just said. <clears throat> Given the strength of the rhetoric from the Trump administration in the past four years and the extent of what they've done with legislative measures even, is it possible even for the Biden administration to, to walk back from some of that approach from China uh, politically in the USA, uh, certainly in the short term or even the longer term? That's a great question, Martin. I think um, I think it is hard uh, in general now because there has been a shift in the uh, the political zeitgeist in the United States to accepting that that the relationship we hope we have with China over forty years is not the one that's developed. Uh, that we have a lot of problems. and that it is increasingly adversarial. Certainly after the the coronavirus that was made, very clear with the wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, the attempts to blame the United States for the virus. Uh, you know, the, these, these actions on the part certainly poisoned uh, the, the sense uh, in the United States of the ability to, uh, to work with China. But if you, if you look at the rhetoric, I would say the Biden administration's actually been harder in rhetoric on China. Than, uh, than the Trump administration was. Trump often talked about his ability to work with Xi Jinping, his respect for Xi Jinping, um, that, you know, that, that this would ultimately work out in many ways. Uh, Biden you know, called Xi Jinping a thug, uh, called him a, he doesn't have a democratic bone in his body. Um, you know, in some ways, I think their rhetoric has actually been, been harder. And certainly the statements from the National Security Advisor, uh, the Secretary of Defense and, and Secretary of State over uh, the past couple of months have made it clear that in their view, the great strategic challenge uh, is, is China. So I, I think it's going to be hard ultimately to walk back, but then there can always be a difference between your rhetoric and what you actually do. That's what people have to keep paying attention to, to look at whatever policies, executive orders and the like, walk things back. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Rana, over to you, please, to talk about the other side, perhaps, and your insight into um, how China responds. Well, thanks very much indeed, Martin. I have to say what I have to say will be complementary in both senses of the word, actually, with complement and complementary. Uh, I don't you know, I disagree with any of the brilliant uh, tour d'horizon that I think that Misha's just given us. And for those who haven't yet read it, and I hope that's few on this call, do order a copy of Asia's New Geopolitics. It's a really stimulating set of essays by Misha about many of the issues, which he's only been able to give us you know, 10 to 12 minutes on just now. And there's an awful lot more I know that he could say on many of those issues. I'm also conscious that unlike um, Misha, who's sitting admittedly uh, locked down, nonetheless, in the belly of the beast in Washington, I'm speaking from the, the leafy confines of Oxford, England, which uh, has the disbenefit of being neither Washington DC nor Scotland, which of course gives it two disadvantages in all sorts of ways, but I'll do my best to overcome those barriers to give a few comments that really pick up on where I think Misha left off. And what I think is the thread running through the three or four points that I'd like briefly to make is that absolutely I would agree with every word of what Misha said in terms of what the Biden administration is trying to do. I'm going to point out where I think that they are going to run uh, into obstacles in doing that, as well as find opportunities. I should add, overall, I don't, I wouldn't bet against them being able to actually bring together a whole variety of those policies. You know, maybe not 100 percent, but quite a large number of them. But I think it's worth being aware, as I know that they are, ahead of time where the difficulties come. And I think that comes from actually the same dilemma that pretty much every liberal society. I don't like to say Western society because, you know, Japan is one of those uh, when it feels like being liberal, which is not all the time. India is one of those. So, you know, it, it's not just about the, the West, but everyone is juggling a set of issues when it comes to thinking about how to engage with China. And I think, you know, China is at the heart of this conversation. We have to be very upfront about that. And those three issues are security, economics and values. And the way in which you decide to balance those particular issues is what you might call a sort of variable geometry. And that variable geometry is not only something that the Biden administration has to deal with, it also has to deal with the fact that its allies, partners, and even countries that are like-minded without necessarily formally being connected, will have different 
angles in that geography without uh, geometry without you know pushing the metaphor too uh, too too far so just to pick up for instance on one of the most obvious ones uh in terms of security and Misha brought up the Quad. Again, the fact that the Quad, the Quadrilateral uh, um, Defense Agreement has become something that's much more concrete than it was even a few years ago is a sign that clearly different actors in that world are looking to try and find means to at least hedge against growing Chinese military strength in the region. And China's perfectly aware of that, of course. But it's also worth pointing out that the level of interest that each of these actors has is still not identical. The United States, I would say, of those four, is the one that probably is, for obvious reasons, stressing security more than anything else. Uh, obviously, it wants to have a decent trading relationship with China. It's got the phase one trade agreement. But at the same time, the United States is not dependent on China in the end in terms of its overall trading relationships globally or indeed in terms of its economy. That, of course, as we've discovered, is less true for Australia. It seems that through force, if not necessarily through will, Australia may be pushed now into alternative trading arrangements with the rest of the uh, of the world. And of course, that's where factors like uh, Brexit, Global Britain comes in, new trade arrangements and so forth coming in. But nonetheless, that has pushed security up the Australian agenda while not removing the issue of, of trade from that particular uh, set of arrangements. Japan, again, which Visha is much more of an expert than I am on, is interesting there and the security arrangement is clearly immensely important, but at the same time, the trading relationship with China is very, very substantial. And within the last few months, new Japanese factories uh, from big companies, Panasonic, Matsushita and so forth, have been set up in uh, major provinces in Eastern China. And I see no signs that Japan Inc is going to be reducing the level by which it chooses to invest in its huge neighbor to uh, to the West from, from Tokyo's point of uh, view. And finally on, on the quad issue, you know, India is I think it, it is sort of very Schrodingerian if that is the right way to put it in terms of the way in which it regards itself as being part of this Indo-Pacific security environment. It's in it when it wants to be and it's not when it's not. And I think that at heart, India is still a country that thinks much more about its immediate neighborhood and about its domestic politics. Narendra Modi is a nationalist politician in the way that Donald Trump was and the way that Xi Jinping is, but he's not like them in as much as I think that in the end, he thinks more about really what is going to be going to provide him security in his own country. He doesn't have a global vision of India. To some extent, that makes him a little more like Donald Trump, actually, than it does um, uh, Xi Jinping, who definitely has a global vision. So even within that one particular sort of marquee showcase environment of the quad, one has to be aware that there's going to be an awful lot of variable geometry and other actors, the United Kingdom, France and others who want to get involved in that are also going to have to calibrate quite actively and probably dynamically over time to try and actually coordinate interests across that. A couple of other notes of things that I think are going to be opportunities, but also I think ones that involve a certain amount of really quite careful thinking and diplomacy for the still fledgling Biden administration. I'm really glad that Misha brought up CPTPP, you know, the, the new reincarnated Trans-Pacific Partnership 2.0, because I think that's going to be a really interesting case of where, as Misha said, words and reality may or may not match. Uh, I think most people on this call will know much of the background that there was a sort of uh, first version of this with the US involved, which basically was scrapped on the first day of President Trump's uh, period in office for just over four years ago. And although, of course, we now have President Biden, there is little likelihood, uh, at least from the noises coming that I hear from outside Washington, we should have other information, but the idea that the US is very quickly going to join this organization in which Japan is really the leading actor now, I think, uh, is relatively low. Interesting in this context is the application, which is now pretty firm of the United Kingdom to join CPTPP. I am one of those rare and probably slightly eccentric people who actually think this is not some kind of crazy you know, uh, venture, but actually an idea which has real possibilities for the UK as a country, which you know, whether one likes it or not, is going to be moving in some interesting and different directions in the next few years. And where there is clearly an opportunity to take in terms of becoming more involved with the Asia Pacific environment. But in that, I would say that there are warnings. First of all, I would say for the UK, in terms of knowing what you're getting into, the interests of most of the CPTP members are not identical to those of a uh, significant medium-sized economy and country off the northwest coast of Europe. And a bit of humility, I think, would be helpful in that understanding. But also, of course, 
a much more interesting question to which I don't have inside information, but I think will be a subject of interest, which is what is the use, and I think it could be considerable, to the Biden administration of a friendly partner European country, the United Kingdom, being inside CPTPP when the US is not? And I don't have the answers to that question, but it's one about which I think we need to have a lot more uh, discussion in the near future. So there's a little challenge to throw to our, our discussion uh, today. A couple of others, climate change, something we haven't yet mentioned. And I am so far intrigued to see the, the way that the Biden administration, in the very, very short term they've been in office, has so far been somewhat more successful than frankly I thought they would be in decoupling, if that's the word of the moment, China from the other multiple issues which are plaguing the US-China relationship to actually separating out the climate change issue. Uh, the visit of Representative John Kerry uh, to uh, Beijing recently, the presence of Xi Jinping electronically in President Biden's climate change meeting are two signs of that. And I think actually in one level, there's a very simple explanation explanation, which you know, brilliant observers familiar to this group like Isabel Hilton of China Dialogue have uh, pointed out, China and also Charlie Parton of RUSI, uh, China has a very vested interest in making sure that global climate change commitments are implemented because it's absolutely necessary for China's economic growth as well. On problems ranging from drought to environmental pollution and greenhouse gas effects, China is, of course, one of the biggest producers of, um, uh, of uh, climate change um, gases in the world. It's also one of the countries most vulnerable to their effects and therefore to that extent I wouldn't be surprised to see that actually possibly somewhat more a productive relationship go well and it is of course an immensely important sign of one major change in that as we all know the previous administration under Donald Trump was not one that really engaged with the global climate change regime in uh, a meaningful way so that makes a, uh, a difference uh, there. Let me finish if I may actually yeah I'll finish with just two quick thoughts but they will be quick. We also need, I think, to bear in mind that I think, and I think many other people think, that the area in which, if you want to go confrontational, call it battleground, if you want to be more tactful, competition, is really going to be at the forefront in the next five to ten years between the Biden administration, the world which it seeks to influence and lead, and that part of the world, which China is the, most, the, the largest part but not the only one, is technology. I think on everything from the past dependency that comes from Huawei, ZTE and other equipment being placed not in Northern Europe, not in North America. I, I, I think it will be surprising if uh, Chinese companies got much of a foothold there after the events of the last year or so. But Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia and all sorts of places which need cheap, easily rolled out 5G capacity. I would not underestimate the ability at the moment of China still to be able to sell this particular starting point for the next stage of technological revolution before the Western world actually acts on the rhetoric which it keeps putting out, but so far I don't see much actually happening in terms of providing an alternative. So I think looking at the field of, of technology, technology that's rolled out will be important. Linked to that also issues such as vaccines. There's been a lot of talk for good reason about Chinese vaccines the last few months turning out not to be as successful as some of the Western ones when you actually look at, at uh, numbers on the ground. And I'm, I'm sure that's true, even though China is, I think in my view, very foolishly uh, covering up some of the figures on this. But take another look at it. How much do you want to bet that in a year's time, in two years time, Chinese vaccines are not at the level that their Western equivalents are, just as many other aspects of their technology have caught up extremely fast. And so thinking about what's happening right now, as if that would extrapolate in a linear fashion to everything that will happen in the next two, five, ten years, I think is probably the biggest mistake that the Biden administration could make. The one thing I would say is that as far as I can tell from, you know, very much from, from the outside, I think it is the case that they do have an awful lot of people who know what they're talking about and who look at the medium to long term as well as the short term. I think there is actually quite a lot of bipartisanship about this particular issue, as I think Misha was indicating and may say more. And one final thing, I think I said, this is the final thing, but I think it's worth noting. The previous administration spent a lot of time talking about values uh, linked issues, uh, Xinjiang re-education camps, Hong Kong security law, and so forth. And this was one of the major sources of eruption between China and the United States. I think it is the case that the Biden administration will find more diplomatic means of engaging with these issues. But I suspect that if you look at people involved, you know, Anthony Blinken, Laura Rosenberger, and others, their commitment to those values 
I'm being a bit controversial here, I know, perhaps with, with some of the, the audience on, on, on the panel, may be deeper, may be more engaged than perhaps at least some of those, not all, some of those involved with the previous administration. And I think China would be well advised not to uh, mistake the Biden administration for simply being the Trump administration in slightly different clothes. In some of those very core areas, including values clashes, I think actually they have a somewhat different view of the world as well. And that will be important for Beijing to keep in mind, as well as for Washington to make clear as it makes uh, its next policy steps known. Uh, I will stop there, I think, uh, Roddy and Martin, so that we can go to questions and, and discussion. Donna and, and Misha, thanks so much for an absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, I'd just like to kick off with, a, with an early question. You, in a way, answered the qu first question I was going to ask, which is how you compare the competence of the Blinken team to that of Pompeo and Co. I think you're inclined, Rana, that, that they are probably more competent. And we haven't heard the word the Thucydides trap for some time. It's lurking out there as an option, certainly some people think, China closing on and in some cases likely to overtake the United States of America. So a comment from each of you on, on those two points. Misha, do you want to lead off on that? Uh, well, I don't, I don't really, you know, the DC policy community is, is actually relatively small. And I'm, I, uh, I think everyone who gets involved, uh, and, um, has been involved as long as the people we see on both sides, uh, is, is competent. Uh, and I, I really wouldn't want to get into, you know, sort of, you know, grading or, or, or comparing. I think if, if you look at, um, you know, uh, people like Matt Pottinger, uh, who served in the Trump administration, and then you, you know, you look at people like Kurt Campbell and the current administration, I, I don't, I think these are all people who have spent a very long time dealing, uh, dealing with, with Asia. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of the fears that people had about the Trump administration, it was going to end the alliances, it was going to walk away. That, that didn't happen. In fact, you saw, you know, the closest U.S.-Japan relationship uh, between the two leaders under Trump in a generation since the 1980s. Um, you, you saw, you know, the Trump administration um, eagerly embrace the, uh, the initiatives of the, uh, the Moon Jae-in administration in South Korea to try to break the, the, the deadlock with North Korea. Uh, and, and so the Trump administration, I think, uh, had people in it who understood the utility of uh, and the importance and the critical importance of alliances. Um, there was no interruption of, of dealing with, with partners. And in fact, I think that if you look at the, you know, you can disagree with it. But I think if you look at the entire set of, of written policies and capstone statements of the Trump administration, there was a fairly coherent worldview uh, and, and fairly coherent view of, of Asia and, and China. Um, the, the policies that were adopted uh, were not perfect as they are in every administration. It was not a complete um, uh, adoption of, 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 of everything that they wanted to do, uh, but that's, that's in every administration. And if you go back and you look at the, at the Obama administration, I think you would see a lot of, uh, of missed opportunities. Um, of course, almost everyone who's in the Trump, uh, in the Biden administration today was in the Obama administration. So it's really, in some ways, an Obama II administration, not a Trump II an administration. And it'll be very interesting to see how they deal with China today vis-a-vis -vis how they did it uh, almost a decade ago or, or in the first term more, more than a decade ago. Um, Roddy, your second question, uh, was that about, what was the second question? That was on the um, the theory about the Thucydides trap, that a rising power. Yeah, I'm not a big fan. Uh, I, I think it misreads history, and I, I think it um, it also uh, misreads Asia. Um, uh, you know, the 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 uh, I don't want to get too much into into it. Uh, I think it, it's 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 a it's not a great idea for two reasons. One uh, is that it sets up a binary. Uh, of war or peace uh, that that often tends in the type of discussions we have to uh, prejudge that we're headed towards a conflict. And, and secondly, um, I think when you read it through, if you take it through the, the ultimate logic, it's that the United States has to accommodate. 
in order to avoid uh, uh, to avoid a, a war. You know, we're in a competition, but to avoid war, um, I, I, I put it aside. I think there's a lot. There are many different ways of thinking uh, about this, this relationship, and I, I think there are many that are more fruitful, um, and that includes. Uh, looking at uh, structural change uh, in the international system. They're looking at um, the strength of, um, uh, quite frankly, of national uh, unity at home, whether you have elites and, and, uh, and non-elites that are, are linked in their understanding of, uh, of, of uh, the challenges and the opportunities that are global, um, looking at capacities. Um, I think we, we in the United States are, you know, we like beating ourselves up in hair shirts and and stating, you know, how, how awful we are in, in so many ways. And yet, you know, I was struck, for example, during the harangue in Alaska by uh, the Chinese state minister, uh, Yang Jachir, that, you know, to me, one of the quick responses should have been, well, if the United States is, is, is so fallen and weak, then why are there 300,000 Chinese students still coming to study here? Uh, why, why is it that, uh, that uh, Chinese businesses are still looking for American partners and, and there are uh, every attempt to get into research institutes? So I, I think we, we uh, overestimate uh, our, our weaknesses in, in many ways, which isn't to say we don't have them. We do, as every nation does. But, uh, you know, I, I think a little bit of perspective is useful. But let me turn it over to Rana. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. Well, I mean, quick, quick follow up on, on, on those thoughts. I, I think I'd agree that actually, um, when thinking about the difference between the Trump administration and the current one, and again, this is something that you know, Nisha may have different views on, what struck me more over the past four years of the Trump administration was how many different views on China there seemed to be within the one administration. So it seemed to me that regardless of what you think of their competence or otherwise, because the question of competence relates to what you want the end point to be. And I think it is fair to say that to take you know, three or four names at the top of my head, Peter Navarro, John Bolton, President Trump himself, Matt Pottinger, who, uh, as uh, Misha's mentioned, and uh, uh, is, you know, I think regarded by everyone who knows China as an extremely expert figure on the uh, on the region. Um, Steve Mnuchin as, 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 as Treasury Secretary. Five people, five really, I think, quite different views on China, not all of them are necessarily pointing in, in the same direction at any one time. If you wanted to complement that, you could call it a team of rivals. If you were less complimentary, there might be other ways to put it. I think that for good or ill, what we've seen so far of the Biden-China message, you know, Kurt Campbell, uh, Laura Rosenberger, um, you know, variety of people who have come into the uh, administration at, at various levels, is that they probably share something of a similar worldview about the relative uh, direction of travel for the next few years. Now, we should remember that agreeing with each other isn't always the best thing either. You know, there was a great deal of agreement in the American administration of the Vietnam question uh, across parties, actually, in the 60s, and that didn't work out so well. I don't think that that is, to be honest, the... Um, way that this uh, administration is going. And actually, for one reason, that's very different from the Vietnam era. One of the problems that we knew about in the past, uh, we've, we've, we've found out in retrospect about uh, what, what happened to use McNamara's phrase in, in retrospect, is that the level of knowledge about what was really happening in Vietnam on the Vietnamese side at that stage was relatively limited. I think that this administration is doing a pretty good job of trying to find out what is actually going on in China and using that to inform what it has to, uh, has to say. But you know, it's only four months old, so even less than that, actually. So uh, we're, we're still talking about a work in, in progress, but it, it looks, I think, impressive so far. Uh, in terms of the Thucydides trap, uh, well, I, Graham Allison, the author of the idea, and I have uh, debated this in, in public more than once and, and had quite a lot of fun uh, doing it. I usually bring up, and I think actually Graham knows him also because he's one of the figures who comes up in this context, the Chinese scholar, Yan Xuetong of Tsinghua University. And if you don't know his work, then you know, do, do check it out because he's one of the most interesting thinkers currently writing on Chinese foreign policy and international relations more broadly out of Beijing at uh, Tsinghua University. He has taken a view which I think actually has a lot to it. And I think I won't get into trouble with that by saying that he doesn't always agree with everything that the current Chinese um, party state uh, thinks about everything, that the relationship between China and Japan is going to be extremely frosty for quite a while to come, certainly for the next decade, but for a whole variety of structural and other reasons, not least to do with China's own interests, going to war is not something that he thinks is a likely occurrence. And since, as I say, he's by no means a kind of shill of the, uh, of the regime, you know, he's someone who thinks for himself, 
if Professor Yen thinks that, then I will take that as an informed Chinese view that we may all be able to avoid, uh, thankfully, I think, the, the worst uh, aspects of that uh, proposed Thucydides trap. Thanks very much. Martin, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rana, and, and Roderick for the question. Um, perhaps, uh, could, could we stick with um, geostrategy, if you don't mind, and, and policy? Uh, we have a very interesting question from uh, Takaoka san, who is uh, Consul General of Japan to uh, Scotland um, and, and a regular at our events in Platte And Takaoka san has asked, um, What do you think of the following hypothesis? Given the conceptual difference between rule of law, rule based international law versus rule by law, brackets the traditional Chinese concept, there is no alternative for us to continue a hundred year marathon in which the Quad plus Europe should compete with China plus, plus, plus Iran, Russia, question mark. And I think this is interesting to step back from just talking about China um, and think of something that uh, Michael said a little earlier about um, values, uh, sorry, it may have been uh, Rana, I believe, about values in the Biden administration. Um, but how do those values from the new US administration and, and the US state and its foreign policy um, analysts and officers in how they will approach this issue of the rule-based international order. So not just dwelling on China, but perhaps Michael, could you say, how do you see this? Is there a threat to the rule-based order? And how do you see the, the new administration will approach this? I, I, uh, I find it hard to, to talk ab about this um, uh, in part, probably because I'm, I'm just not smart enough to get my head around all of the different aspects of it and, and in part because this is and i'm not saying it's a bad question martin but th this is like the question in washington these days there's this sort of this sort of i mean if, if washington collectively lies down on a psychiatrist's couch this is the question that is is takes up the entire hour which is is the the putative rules-based order as if it were some sort of ontological reality set up after 1945 uh that it's is tangible and we can touch it and feel it and 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 if you poke it here it reacts there um is that about is that about to collapse and i guess i speak and but you know you, you have the the misfortune today of having two historians talking you know you should not have ever two historians you should have someone who actually knows something about the world and has done something in the world as opposed to the two of us uh, of course i speak mostly for myself not rana but um you know, it, it, the values are critical, and yet the values also, in some ways, are very incidental. And I don't mean to to, to try to, to to punt the question. Um, look, it, you know, as a realist, to me, you know, it, it comes down ultimately to interests and power. It's what your interests are and whether you have the power to affect them or not. Um, the the post-1945 system itself very incomplete itself very uh, honored in the in the breach as as much as in the observance uh, was was a set of aspirations about how nations should act in order both to prevent conflict that the world had just gone through twice in the space of a generation uh, as well as to benefit those who had come out victors from the war and and had already largely based their own economies on these very concepts of, of, of you know sovereignty among nations of international law of arbitration and and, and so on and so forth um, it, you know the we, we call it the Cold War for a very good reason I mean we were largely at war with an entirely separate system during that period in which supposedly our international rules based order um, was was predominant and then of course we had the post, the post Cold War era, where very quickly we were dragged into the Middle East, and uh, you know, after two thousand one, we had maybe a decade, uh, and then almost seamlessly transitioned into competition with China. So I'm I'm less convinced that there ever was, you know, uh, you know, the the reality of this rules based order uh, in the way that it sometimes becomes totemic in Washington is what I'm trying to say is that people freeze themselves into saying, well, you can't do anything to to undermine the rules-based order uh, while you know, not you know, really acknowledging that in so many ways it, it's, it's, a, it's an order of convenience, it's an order of, um, of optionality, it's an order of, of power. Is China and Russia and Turkey in, in, in different ways trying to, um, to set up a more traditional block 
styled system uh, that so that the international system itself has uh, paramount points, um, undoubtedly. Uh, but but you know, powerful states have always tried to do that. And in some ways, it harks back to what Henry Kissinger talked about in in the 1970s with a pentapolar world. Um, I, I don't think we have an answer to it because I don't think we fully understand what, first of all, what it means to have uh, predominant powers in, in subregions, which in some ways we've always had, and in other ways, what how far it would be taken. And I'll just end by saying the big question that this often comes down to is the South China Sea. You know, will, will there be a free and open South China Sea? Um, freedom of navigation. And I think it's just, you know, it, it's, it's unknowable uh, what China would actually like to do with the type of, of capabilities that it is building and the type of claims that it has had. If we make the assumption that China understands that so much of the benefit that it's gotten over the past decades has been from this more cooperative, more quote unquote rules based system and whether they're willing to completely junk that in order to ostensibly become a dominant power in East Asia. So I, mean, I, just, I just think intellectually we haven't thought it through enough. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I know it's not a, a, um, a satisfactory answer. Actually for a historian on a geopolitics question, I think it's a great answer. It, um, <laughs> thank you very much. I think you should note for, for the end of your answer there with the South China Sea issue and, and international rules-based order, obviously the USA I think it's not a signatory of the UN law of the sea. Um, it, We've signed it, but we haven't ratified it. Exactly, exactly. But, but, but we basically follow it in, in, in all of our maritime activities. Sure. Uh, the US Navy follows it in, in almost all of its, in all of our maritime activities. Yeah. It just hasn't um, been formally ratified. Unlike the French Navy outside the Channel Islands, according to today's news reports from the UK, but that's a different story. R Rana, how do you see the rules-based system as a historian still? Uh, Indeed. We're now talking about Asia, not Jersey, I take it. Um, so, <laughs> again, I think that one of the, and again, the question that comes from uh, the Consul General uh, is interesting in its phrasing, the 100-year marathon, because that reminds me of the title of the book by very interesting uh, somewhat, how can I put it, unconventional Washington thinker in the shape of Michael Pillsbury, with whom I've had a cup of coffee actually in my office in Oxford in the days when we could have people into our, uh, into our offices. Um, so uh, I would say that um, I think that actually, let's not worry about the next 100 years, or we can do if you want to. Let's think about the next decade, because I think that is the most important period in terms of some of the things that are going to decide where the US, China, uh, competition, cooperation, competition, whatever you want to call it, confrontation even, is going to be worked out. Both for the United States and China, it's going to be, I think, a quite decisive decade in various ways. But various long-term factors, and the demographics is one that I always bring up, is really going to change the way that China engages with itself and the world in about 10 years' time. In the year 2031, uh, well, even possibly before that, China's population is really going to start dipping and also become older. So the 2020s is really quite a crucial decade in terms of China actually achieving a lot of things which, as far as I know, all of us could be reasonably happy with. The idea that China becomes a, in its terms, Xiaokang, moderately prosperous society. You know, why shouldn't China be in that position? Middle income, middle class, um, hopefully finding ways to create a stable and, you know, growth-driven home, uh, home economy. We'd all be quite happy with, uh, with, with that. But the consequences of some of the other policies that we're talking about are really, I think, where these things are, uh, you know, going to be in flux for quite some time to, uh, to, 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 to come. And in answer to your question about, you know, do we have to be perhaps even if it's a 10-year marathon rather than a 100-year marathon, I would say, let's work out the answers to the challenges that China is posing. And some of the challenges are going to be ones that the liberal world clearly is not happy with. I mean, particularly to do with issues such as territorial and maritime boundaries and individual civil liberties and human rights. Hong Kong, Xinjiang were brought up, let's bring them up again. But I think the honest way to do this is to A, be incredibly upfront about these issues, Hong Kong national security law, there you are, said it again. Let's also honestly answer the questions where China puts forward ideas which actually have some validity to them. So, or at least acts in ways that actually we could think about. So one of the reasons that China has such an innovative tech ecology is that it has, and I think the, the euphemism I'm gonna use is uh, appropriated without, uh, without attribution, at least some intellectual property. 
But China has also spent, I think last time I checked, 2.4% uh, of its GDP year and year, year by year on research and development, creating a really impressive indigenous cadre of researchers in artificial intelligence, you know, quantum uh, computing, vaccine technology, you know, all these sorts of areas. Yes, this is something that, you know, I think China has clearly decided it's going to use its massive resources to put efforts into. And we have to look at that and say, well, actually, isn't that something we could, you know, take on board and, and learn from? Or another issue. I mean, one of the things that China brings up over and over again is the idea of collective values over individual ones. And I don't buy this. I'll say that quickly now, because collective and individual both matter. But collective does matter. If you are saying, as China, through whatever mechanisms, you have managed to bring 800 million people out of poverty, you know, it becomes almost a mantra and you roll your eyes when you hear it, but it does have the benefit of being broadly true. In the same way, if you look at people who look at the effects of Chinese FDI through the Belt and Road Initiative in many parts of the world, Pakistan, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and so forth, for many people, that's actually a good news story. And it's partly a story of, well, why isn't the rest of the world giving us a 5G that we can manage with? Why isn't the rest of the world providing health, uh, health uh, care measures or uh, malaria prevention uh, equipment, whatever else that we might be? Now, sometimes we don't talk enough about what we're doing in the world to actually make this happen. And Japan, the UK, the US have all been immensely big spenders on this, but actually, that doesn't make China's contribution to that particular um, area invalid at all. So I think it's important for us to be absolutely upfront and not step back for a moment from those central liberal values which define us. But I think, as I say, we'd give ourselves more nuance and more ability to actually look China in the eye by saying, by the way, here are these things that you're doing, and you know what? We actually rate those. And, you know, imitation, the best form of flattery. Let's work out how we, the richest part of the world even now, can draw on those aspects to make ourselves, I think, more straight-eyed and clear-eyed when we're saying to China, here are these other areas where, sorry, we don't like what you're doing. Rana, thank you very much. Um, you've laid out um, a policy agenda, I think, with what you just said that, uh, that, that many people from government should take note of. Um, so although you're both historians and we, we've quizzed you on um, geopolitical issues, uh, could we ask um, questions about economics of two historians if we're not dragging you too far away from your core competencies? But we have some terrific questions from the audience. I do think it is worth um, trying to bring some of them in. So earlier, Terence uh, asked, I'll ask several of the questions together, if you don't mind, just to sort of try and link them. Terence uh, Brendickson asked, uh, you say the Chinese administration is top down and authoritarian, but China also has a dynamic bottom up commercial and merchant economy. Isn't this spontaneous capitalist side to China more important for all who are not policy wonks? We do have an economist on, on the uh, call today, George Magnus, and George has mentioned that uh, David Frum has an interesting piece in Atlantic titled China is a paper dragon. The gist of this is a lot of people knowingly or otherwise succumb to Beijing's narratives about itself which are, shall we say, not always accurate. Do you think that we exaggerate the risk China poses, A, generally, B, in Asia? And if so, how should the US change the way it behaves? So excuse me if I ask both of them together, but I think it's useful to talk about economics and also from the perspective of people and companies in China. We have a lot of business people who join us for these calls. Having lived and worked there for a very long time myself until recently, people who you meet and talk to in business don't say the same things as their government. So obviously there's a great deal of political dogma from the central people's government that isn't repeated by ordinary business folk. And I think that's what Terence Brendickson is getting at, but maybe coming, Rana, could we ask you first this time? Because we, we start with China. Do you think that business should just keep doing what it's doing with China and ignore the political dogma going to, to George's and Terence's points? Um. No, I don't think uh, business should ignore political dogma because actually politics rather than, you know, dogma of course is in and of itself a negative term. So I'd like to be you know, a bit more neutral and just say, I don't think business can or should ignore politics in China any more than it ignores politics in the United States or in the European Union or Britain or anywhere else. Uh, if I could just do a brief plug for anyone who'd like a, a longer take on this. Um, I've got a piece actually co-authored with a friend Elspeth Johnson in the current edition of the Harvard Business Review called What the West Goes Wrong, what the, what the West Gets Wrong About China with three points that uh, we hope that you know business uh, folk might want to, to, to read uh, and, and, and think about. But broadly speaking, I think actually we can put together something that again is potentially counterintuitive 
but I think really important in terms of understanding the two elements, the two questions you, you've just put to us, uh, Martin. One of which uh, from George, you know, is about whether or not China um, kind of either believes too much of its own propaganda or we believe too much of its own propaganda in a sense, but also that uh, that, 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 that other uh, question of whether or not the kind of dynamism of China's economy is something that we have to take more into account. And I think that we can bring these together by actually looking at what China says about its own economy. And perhaps surprisingly for those of us who, who live in the West, China these days has become much more upfront, uh, particularly if you look at you know, the theoretical journals, Qiu uh, Shi, Seeking Truth, which is um, the Chinese Communist Party's main theoretical journal. And I have to tell you, keep a part of them by the bed for uh, bedtime reading. It's, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it, 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 it's a laugh a minute, as you can, can imagine. But they put forward the idea very explicitly that Marxist-Leninism, which has always been part of the way in which China thinks about its own politics or since 1949, is still very much the right way to think about how China is operating in the world. And lots of the languages used there, Dou Zheng, Mao Dun, you know, uh, struggle, contradiction, these sorts of terms are ones that Misha, as a good historian and therefore someone who knows about Hegel will uh, recognize, I think, along with, I don't know how big Hegel is these days amongst the DC policy wonks, but the historians will certainly recognize him as still being, being relevant. This idea that essentially there are um, different factors within society as a whole, and that can include the party and the state and the way they interact, can actually be highly productive. Well, what does all that kind of rise slightly theoretically abstract uh, set of thoughts mean in practice in this case? It means that some of the things that if we come from a liberal point of view might not seem to make sense, that you can have an immensely heavy top-down and quite authoritarian, very authoritarian party state, which can still choose to nurture a highly innovative economic environment is something that shouldn't make sense in terms of a lot of the economic theories we've come to uh, to believe in the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years. But nonetheless, China is a living example of actually how it can be brought together in, in that form. For a very long time, there was a sort of conventional wisdom, and frankly, I've said it uh, you know, in, in the past too, that China would not be able to innovate. China would not be able to produce technological innovation because the way in which its top-down political control operated meant that simply couldn't happen. Well. I give you Alibaba, I give you Tencent, I give you Hikvision, I give you, you know, ZT, or whichever company. Now, let's not avoid the fact that all of these are uh, companies that are highly entwined with the Communist Party, and they all have party cells within them. They're very much part of the party state structure, but they have also been able to carve out, in global terms, a really rather unique structure in which to grow and operate. Now, China has certain advantages. It has huge scale, which other, you know, very few other countries have that size and scale to be able to, to operate in. And also China gets it wrong on many, many, many occasions, as anyone uh, who's trying to deal with China's, who's looked at China's debt problem uh, will, uh, will, will tell you. But I think it would also be mistaken not to acknowledge that on a whole variety of things that have, at least you know, in the short term, clearly worked out well, Clearly, there are elements of China's formulation, its ability to combine authoritarianism with consumer economy, with global ambition and with technological innovation that mean that it is at least a, an economic and social and political model that is worth examining to understand what it is that they've done, if only because we in the liberal world put ourselves, either in friendly or unfriendly terms, in competition with it. And to be in competition with something else, you need to understand it. Rana, thank you very much. Michael, I'd like to bring you in for that because we're running out of time, but I think what George Magnus was getting at is, um, is a phrase you'll be familiar with from the USA, uh, China is not 10 feet tall, um, which, which originated, I think, uh, talking about the Soviet Union. So would you like to come, bringing this back to the USA, because we're talking about US foreign policy, um, yeah. we tend to dwell on China r r rather a lot, but could, could you bring this back to US policy? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I'll do what is so annoying uh, that all authors do and say, well, I wrote an entire book about this, but you know, I, I wrote a book called The End of the Asian Century in 2017, which was precisely to bring up this question about what, what are the stories that we're not hearing about Asia. Uh, it, was, it was Asia broadly, but you know, a, a huge chunk of the book was on China. And it was precisely to interrogate this question about you know what is it that that we that when I started this book it was China was 12 feet 20 feet tall and it was going to dominate everything of course if you 
uh, did Japan the way that I've spent so much of my professional career doing Japan. You'd already gone through this in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and so the, a huge chunk of this book, probably about a third of it, was about the problems in China, political problems, demographic problems, environmental problems, economic problems, financial problems, so on and so forth, that at least should have given us pause when we think about China. And as we think about China today, by the way, so uh, let's say I started research on that book 2010, it came out in 2017, today we're at 2021. You know, China's gone from 12 and 10% growth down to maybe 6% growth. Now, of course, it's part of a larger pie. So 6% growth on an economy of this size is more than 10% growth in an economy half the size. But the point is that the macro picture has already shown a dramatic slowing down uh, uh, in China. It's, an, it's a, you know, it's reaching towards what, you know, the economists call a middle income trap. Um, it is evolving and evolving in ways that, that Rana just, I mean, very excellently pointed out in terms of the innovation that many of us thought that it would not be able to do that, that uh, it is doing. And yet it is still uh, a question about, I think, an open question about the degree to which, uh, and this feeds into, I think, US assessments of China, um, that uh, first of all, that all of this is sustainable over the long run, and, and it may well be. But more than that, whether it is, uh, I'm not exactly sure of the word to use, whether it's organic, in a way that we know that the state focuses on certain technologies that it is deploying uh, for specific purposes. And, and obviously best known in this case are uh, surveillance technologies. So facial recognition, voice recognition and the like, um, which requires massive computing power and, and uh, all the advanced elements of, of really what we think of when we talk about artificial intelligence, the ability to look through a crowd and, and, and pick someone out. Um, Obviously, it's putting an enormous amount of energy into um, its chip making uh, capabilities, fabrication of chips. And yet, uh, as our, our um, uh, joint friend, uh, Neil Ferguson, uh, points out, you know, five years ago, China was five years behind us on chips. And today it's five, year, five years behind us on chips. I mean, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's always going to be the case. But certainly, as we look back, we see that it has not been able to turn some of the significant uh, dog legs in, in, in getting to the type of production that it wants. And that actually reflects back directly on what Rana said about, about vaccines. Um, the meta point, which is, you know, do you believe that in another year or five years, they won't be simply as good as those in the West? Well, we, you know, we've been saying that about semiconductors for quite some time, and it doesn't mean that in five years they won't be. But again, it's, I guess it's that question of the organic development. Um, it, we, we have a problem here in the States in that, the, you know, when you think of the technological innovations that really drove the post-World War II era, uh, they came out of government spending. But after World War II, a great deal of that government spending was simply showering research institutes with money, you know, Bell Labs and RCA Labs and the like, with broad goals in mind. You know, they wanted certain things, but it was out of that that so many of the technologies of today developed. Uh, and, you know, and this is, is not my particular area, I wish it were. Um, but, but that was that what happened was the, the state direction of, you know, we want a, a better, you know, missile or a better, better missile warning system, or whatever it was, became a much more organic uh, technological development and, and ecosystem that, that simply created all of these unexpected benefits that fundamentally transformed uh, the way that that we live our lives and, and business is done. And I guess the question is, is that what we're going to see in China? I think a good example possibly to look at is Japan and Japan's failures at this in the 1980s and 1990s, when it was the same, uh, the same attempt to uh, get ahead of the technological curve to become dominant in what the, the state believed would be key technologies, supercomputing, um, certain consumer, you know, it's, it's sort of funny to talk about, but, you know, Betamax versus VCR and then LCD versus plasma. Japan made a lot of the wrong bets. Some things, you know, were permanently transformative uh, in terms of, for example, robotics in the car industry and the entire way that they, they structured those, but other things they failed at dramatically. And so if we see a, a China that's very successful in, in certain areas, um, I think there's still the broader question of, of whether in our own assessment of where China is going to be, 
Um, it actually has the, uh, uh, and Rana said, you know, because of the way it's top down structured, whether it has the, the, the fertile soil and the, the, you know, quite frankly, although it sounds somewhat like a cliche, the freedom to allow people to explore uh, and take risk and be confident in taking risk, that there will be reward from it should they be successful, that that will allow um, uh, the type of growth that we want. And I guess one way simply to look back at what's happening now is to look at what, and I think it's very good work that Jude Blanchett's doing at the Center for Strategic International Studies uh, on state capitalism, what he sees as growing state capitalism in China. And we see a clamping down and you, you know, it's how we interpret that. But if you look at what's been happening with uh, Jack Ma and with uh, Ant and the like over the past couple of, of, uh, of months, if, if not year or so, there is a cultural question that comes into it, which is, will people in China be willing to take the types of risks that a Jack Ma took if they look and see what's happened to Jack Ma uh, and the type of control that has been reasserted over, over his economic uh, endeavors? And, and that's just one of a number of examples. So um, is it a paper tiger? You know, uh, I don't know, you know, how far, I haven't read David's piece. I don't know how far he took it. I don't know if he quoted the excellent end of the Asian century to talk about the, the doubts that we should have. Um, but yeah, I think, I think a not small part of China's success has been its ability to get us to accept its narrative as opposed to doing the hard work that people like Rana and Jude Blanchett and others do about actually looking at what's going on inside society so that we can have a better basis for making those decisions. But Michael, um, Rana, I think we're absolutely privileged to have taken an hour of your time. Uh, I've had more insight from this hour into um, what may come next in Asia um, in relation to great power relationships and economics from two historians and geopolitics from two historians. Uh, really, I'm very grateful. I do apologize to all of our audience members who asked such terrific questions that we didn't have time to get to, but we should really stop as people have meetings and other appointments. Um, but re really privileged and thank you very much. Could I hand over to Roddy, our chairman of Asia Scotland Institute, to, uh, to close? Thank you, Roddy. Martin, thank you very much. And I'd just like to echo your thanks to our two formidable speakers at the cutting edge of this particular subject. Speaking from the city where Adam Smith lived part of his life and where he's buried, uh, I'm conscious of the high regard in which Adam Smith and his early teachings and writings are held in many parts of Asia, including China. And I think some of the things that we talked about today and heard about carry me back to Adam Smith's writing about the efficiencies of the way in which people might work and work together without duplicating each other's efforts. So since the Asia Scotland Institute is set up to significantly increase people's knowledge and understanding of Pan-Asia, within which sits, of course, China in a very important place, um, this dialogue and this webinar has been spot on. And on behalf of the very many people listening, because there's still a lot of them online, I can see, Thank you, both of you, so much. Uh, and we are where I suppose East almost meets West, um, between Oxford and uh, Washington DC. And, and thank you again very much for your, your contributions and your thoughtful comments. And Martin, thank you and the team for laying it on. Thank you all and good afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye.